Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Williams, and you are watching another episode of Retail Redeveloped. We have started a new thing here where we are bringing you both the audio and the video. So if you're listening to this right now, pop over to the YouTube channel, uh, pop over to Instagram and and look at our, our beautiful faces so you, you don't just get to hear my voice. Uh, I'm so excited today. I've been, I've been meaning to do this show for a long, long time, and uh, I'm I'm humbled to be joined by one Kathleen Jordan. I work with very, very intelligent commercial real estate people all the time. I work with very intelligent retail centric architects all the time. But Kathleen is on a very, very short list of people that I respect. When I get in a jam, I'm known to call her or text her at odd hours saying, hey, am I, am I off thinking about this? She has an insanely well-versed knowledge of what makes retail tick. And I am extremely excited. Kathleen Jordan, department store and retail practice leader and principal at Gensler. Uh, Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, Adam. It's it's, uh, it's a real treat to to come and and talk retail with with you. It, it's uh, you know this this is a passion of mine for going on thirty years. And um, started out in the business. I I graduated out of school in a in a recession um, after uh, the Black Friday in October of eighty seven, and um, ended up working for a company called Kinney Shoe Corporation for one year, which was owned by Woolworth Corporation. Um, and they owned uh, Lady Foot Locker, uh, Champ Sports, and I worked on developing the first Champ Sports prototype. And, and after that, the die was cast. I was just forever going to be in retail and um, got a job in, at Walker Group CNI, which was pretty much the preeminent retail design firm um, at the time, back in the back in the 80s. And and had the chance to work with Ken Walker for 10 years. And he was probably one of the people responsible for creating retail design as a discipline on its own. And, um, and from there, I came to Gensler. And I've been here at Gensler for 22 years. And I have seen everything from department stores to small specialty, large specialty prototypes, um, branding. I, I've seen branding come to life. I mean, when I started in the profession, people didn't qu- talk about branding. Um, and, and now it's all about what your brand is and what your brand culture is. And, and so um, where, I've, where I started um, very much on the tactical part of creating retail environments, I've now become much more tactical on the strategy side because I think retailers need to step back and take a look at what it is they're creating. And it's not necessarily always about space. It's about that, that feeling and that connection with your customer. Yeah, I, we're we're in a we're in a time right now where experience is everything. Uh, you can get anything you want from the click of a button. What is going to get people in the store to to put down their mouse and their keyboard and and come and actually uh, hang out in the real world for a few minutes? But I, I want to go back a, a little bit more to your so so we met in Charlotte when you when you when you took over the retail practice in Charlotte. Walk me through your experiences in Manhattan. Before you came down here, walk people through what you were working on up there and, and what made you want to kind of bring some of that experience down to Charlotte. Just walk people through a little bit about, you know, you, your years up there, some of the projects, some of the things that you learned. Just give people a little bit of a glimpse into, into, into how you spent your time and, and how you cut your teeth and how you became kind of who, who you are today. Sure. So I think um, some of the the early projects that um, I did in my career, a department store called uh, Galleries Lafayette in New York City, and it actually had a one-year shelf life. It had gone into the old Bonwit Teller space, and that that was when I was at Walker Group CNI. And, um, you know, I think I learned on that one the importance of merchandising, because we we designed a beautiful store. I worked um, hand in glove with uh, the partner in charge and, and we really crafted a gorgeous store and um, we felt it really, really felt Parisian and, and it gave that, that experience for people in New York um, to have a little bit of Paris, uh, you know, at, at the top of Fifth Avenue. And what happened was that um, Geller Zafiette gave, um, gave the merchandising point of view more focused to mid-tier as opposed to 
um, bringing in brands that were uniquely Parisian, um, going to higher price points. They wanted to make it more accessible, more generic, more broad appeal. And the store failed in a year. And it wasn't a cheap store to build. And, and for me, this was very early in my career. So it was a little bit of soul crushing um, to see something that we had labored so hard on um, to be defeated. But, but it really taught me the importance of proper merchandising and understanding who your target audience is and um, how, to, how to craft that story so that your product flies off the shelf. I mean, that's, that's really what the goal needs to be. And so um, as I, I grew up in the industry and uh, worked a lot with Neiman Marcus, um, Lord & Taylor, Hex, um, various May Company brands, uh, Macy's, you know, it, it all be, became very important to understand what the merchants wanted to do in the stores um, and, and really work with them on, on what it was they were going to be putting in those stores and how to display them to um, they're most appealing and, and the most attracting and weaving in visual merchandising so that you're crafting a story and you're not just presenting goods for sale. Um, you know, and I think it got elevated once I got to Gensler. So I had this basic toolkit of how to work with um, the store teams and how to work with the merchant teams. And, and then coming into um, the brand realization became very strong. So Gensler has um, a, a strong brand strategy as well as retail design practice. And so we partner those two together. And I think um, where we really did some great work was along Fifth Avenue. I mean, we did the NBA flagship worked very closely with the NBA on crafting what that story was going to be, how to portray the teams, give everybody, you know, equal status under, you know, under one roof. Um, and we worked with Adidas on their flagship, which was two blocks up the street, and, and how to create um, the, the proper environment for what they called the creator. And so it was interesting because if you go and visit NBA and you go and visit the Adidas flagship, they're two very different in, um, experiences. And I think what's amazing is that the Adidas store really sets itself up as an experiential retail environment. And, and it invites people to come in and play. And even in the storefront area, we ripped out a, a lot of what would be useful GLA for um, creating these large bleachers that actually look out in, onto the street. And what it was is an invitation for people to come in and to be part of the store and to be able to look out on what we call the field of play, which is every day, which is outside on the streets. Um, has a running track and areas where you can test and try soccer balls and things like that. So it really is about engagement with the product and the sales staff within the store. But at NBA, it's more about a showcase. And you're, you're talking about a brand. You're showcasing those teams, their, the jerseys of the players, some history moments, things like that. So one, one is about engagement and the other one's about showcasing. So, um, you know, it really, it depends on what the brand wants. And, and again, these are sort of all pieces of my toolkit that I take forward. Um, we did the, the Microsoft flagship farther up the street on Fifth Avenue also. And, you know, the funny thing about that one is we had developed a prototype for, for that brand. And um, so most of the stores look the same, but then it gets individualized a little bit per market. And this, this was a flagship for them. This was beyond your average store. Um, so really the showpiece became the facade and it was this beautiful old townhouse. Um, Fendi had been in the store previously and we, um, we really modernized it up through the fourth floor, keeping, uh, working with landmarks to keep the upper portion of the building, but created what um, later became called the culture wall up at the, up at the third and fourth floor levels. And it, it's a massive LED screen and, it, it wasn't deemed as signage because you, you're you never seeing Microsoft's name on it and you're never seeing their product on it. But it runs um, digital art content constantly. So, so it became a very active facade, um, which is in line with, with Microsoft's brand. So, again, different responses um, for, for working with different brands. And, and I think when I saw the opportunity to come down to Charlotte, um, 
I, it, Charlotte, Charlotte still needs development in the retail space. And I just thought um, this was a place that I could come and share what I know about how to set brands up for success and how to appeal um, and attract customers in the local marketplace and how to work with developers um, to create a point of view in their, whether it's a mixed use development or even a podium of a building, um, how to craft an offering for um, the, the local audience, be it an office tower or um, within a catchment area of a suburban air, neighborhood. So how do you take, I mean, we're talking about Adidas, Microsoft, NBA, these worldwide sensational brands. How do you take a brand that is so established, so entrenched, and translate that brand that everybody in the world has some kind of impression about, or you know, most people in the world, and, and translate that into sticks and bricks? Like, what is that brand discovery look like uh, and and how do you go about translating that into into brick and mortar well you know the i'll use um adidas as an example because they they so knew who they were and that that's where our job is easy um they very much have a stake in the sand with regard to sports with regard to how they want to support the people that use their products. So they call their consumers the creators. And um, they feel that the creators take their product and then become better versions of themselves. And they create a lifestyle for themselves through sports um, and through activity to live a better life. And so we wanted to create an environment that evoked that partnership between the brand and the consumer to allow them to embrace what it was that they were looking to engage with, be it soccer, sport, football, um, running. Running is a huge thing for them. Um, and, and be able to educate the consumer. So, um, and understanding sort of who, who you are in that marketplace um, is super important. Like Adidas didn't want to be glitzy. They didn't want to be... Um, you know, their, their, their consumers are not um, high fashion necessarily, or if they are, it's more on the street side. So they wanted to be able to, to convey a, um, an ethos of rawness and, um, you know, the creator being the raw material. And then they use the equipment that they can get through Adidas um, to, to improve and embellish and augment. And so the space actually was was a real gift because instead of having to go in and and create concrete floors and con concrete walls um, it actually was a concrete structure and we were able to expose all of it and clean it up and allow it to be the beautiful piece of architecture um, that it originally was and, and so um, in that particular case, it was quite a reductive effort as opposed to because it, it had been a Build-A-Bear previously. So, you know, to take a Build-A-Bear and, and strip it down to its core and reimagine it um, into this um, s slightly more polished than gritty environment um, for Adidas was was quite a task. But um, at the end of the day, the, the CEO walked the space and, and said that it was the single best brand expression that they had in their fleet of stores. And it, and it was also a, a big leap for them because their biggest store to date had been 5,000 square feet and the flagship was 45,000 square feet. So that's a, that's a tremendous leap. And so to be able to take the client through um, – what does that growth look like? What are, what are all the brand extensions within their world that now can have their own home and um, can be portrayed in a meaningful way to, to be a, a substantial portion of the family? So, you know, they have the Adidas Originals, they have men and women, they have children, they have running, soccer, et cetera. So, um, you know, each of those suddenly could get serious representation as opposed to a shelf or, you know, a wall. So let's talk about, obviously everybody knows what's going on right now. We're in a 
insane time for retail in particular, which makes yours and my job interesting to say the mm-hmm. least. Oh yeah. Uh, what brands do you think are going to survive, thrive? What brands do you think are, are going to be able to, to translate to this unprecedented time? Uh, it could be a new brand. It could be somebody that's been around for a while it could be somebody that's uh, that's that's morphing with the times. Who do you think's brand is is going to shine through all of this, um, or whose brand do you think is just going to get cast by the by the wayside? Well, you know, it, it's this this is all just um, sort of uh, postulation from the wings, but um, I think there's a couple of different things going on here. We're seeing national retailers kind of checking out. Um, I think the the owners of um, New York and company announced that they're looking at bankruptcy also. Um, We've seen a fair bit of this, you know, Neiman Marcus, um, who's been a client of mine um, now, now refinancing under, under um, chapter 11. So it's, um, I, I think this has pushed a lot of retailers to the edge where they already were at the edge. Um, and, and I don't think it's surprising that it's a lot of these national chains that are sort of in the middle, you know, pier one, um, stores that don't necessarily have a sharp point of view that their, their goods are not particularly unique, that there's not, um, there's not that one-on-one bond with the consumer. And I think, there's something very interesting going on with regard to community driven support. Um, I was, I was looking at a a poll recently where it was saying of the consumers asked, um, they 90% said that they will on purpose focus on supporting local retail um, at coming out of this. And I think we're definitely seeing that with restaurants um, where people are putting their dollars and supporting through takeout to make sure those restaurants are going to be open um, when we get to the other side of this. And I think retail is the same way. I think that the mom and pops actually have a real opportunity to survive. I know financially it's been hard and the PPP money hasn't, hasn't been exactly um, as accessible as everybody was thinking it was going to be. But I do know of, of quite a few small, small retailers that are doing better now than they actually had previously. And it's because um, they actually have a connection with their consumer and they have a very sharp point of view in their store. And so people are continuing to frequent that because there's a reliability there of, of what that, um, that store owner provides. And it's that human connection and engagement that I think we all missed a lot during, um, during being quarantined. And, um, you know, the, the national chains really don't have that. And, and I think the way to come out of that is, is how do you empower store staff? How do you empower store managers? Um, you know, I think that luxury brands have a huge advantage. Um, their, their numbers are, are, um, continuing to be strong. Um, even, even despite, you know, I mean, Gucci was reporting, um, crazy high numbers and while it was still, um, lower than it had been, it, it was it was pretty staggeringly high, and now as we see China um, start to come out of this, that their numbers are increasing. So the luxury brands have the advantage because there is that very sharp point of view, there is that um, perception of value, perception of brand equity. Um, Kathleen, explain what you mean by sharp point of view. L- unpack that a little bit. Explain to people what what that means to you. Well, to me, it's 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 very much about hyper curation. It's, it's about knowing what that product's going to be, um, what the quality of it's going to be, um, how, it, how it goes with your lifestyle. And there's an alignment there um, of the consumer and the brand culture around what that product is. I think that's well said. Hyper curation is a, is a term that I think is is going to be a necessity if you have any meaningful amount of square footage in your project. Oh, uh, I ab- think ab- that, absolutely. I, I think that everything that we've seen is a, is a insane fast forward on the trends that were already happening. And if you're not giving people a reason to come and, and 
hang out at your at your XYZ development or or store or you know you know pick whatever a level in the chain that you want to go, you, you might as you might as well not come out of the starting gate. Um, yeah. I, I'd love to understand getting back to sticks and bricks. What mm-hmm. do you think? And I, I get that we're in the middle innings here, right? I, I get that we don't have a crystal ball. I get that nobody really understands what this what this is going to mean, how long this is going to last, yada yada yada. What do you think will be the lasting impacts in your world, in the actual sticks and bricks design uh, world? Are we going to see a lot more? hyper flexible spaces where maybe you design a space to be used for a couple of different uses. Is it just, we have the luxury of good weather. Is it going to be lots of outdoor space where people are feeling like they're getting fresh air? Are there going to be UV lights hanging over us all the time, killing germs? Like, like what do you see as something that that's not just like a, a passing fad? Like, Oh, we thought that was important for five minutes, but you know, that was lip service. What do you think? What do you think we're going to still be talking about in three years in your world from a design perspective that, that was born or amplified right now? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one of it is about putting the customer at ease. So how do you make them feel good about coming back to the store? How do you, out of leaving their home um, and making your store a, a particular destination? So that puts the onus on the retailer of giving them a good reason to come giving them a better reason to stay and all the more important to come back. So, so there's a couple of things in, in that loop there that I think will, will, will be hyper important. And and one of them is going to be the cleanliness, the perception of cleanliness, how diligent um, the retailer is about that. And um, you know, there's stores that people have walked into and, and turned back around because the store isn't kept well. And that, and while that not may not necessarily have anything to do with hygiene, there's a perception there that um, I think is going to put pressure on retailers to make sure that um, displays can be kept orderly in an easy fashion. Um, I think there's going to be um, a, a larger integration of digital the in space than currently exists now. I think we've seen an adoption rate of something like three to five ten, three to three to five percent, or three to five fold of um, people using digital than in the previous year. So we've leaped leapfrogged years to where um, the adoption rate, you know, would not have been without COVID, and. We're seeing 50% of people or more saying they're going to continue online shopping habits. And what that does is, is, you know, there's a certain flexibility in the shopping pattern now that, that people are coming to rely on and have found create um, an easier way in their life. So everybody lives for convenience. We've always talked about how digital should bring convenience to, to people's lives. And I think it's proven it has um, in different ways. And whether we see um, the continued increase of um, buy online, pick up curbside or in store, um, you know, certainly with the grocery shopping, I mean, who would think that so many people would turn over um, personal choice of selecting vegetables to um, pickers in a store, but, but they have. And so how do you get those people back in? Is it, is it about cooking classes and is it, is it about, um, you know, wine education or something like that in store to to bring people in. Because at the end of the day, if you can get people in your store, they're still going to buy more. So, you know, how do you augment um, the buy online and incentivize people to come back? Um, I think we're going to see a bit of showrooming um, continuing to increase. Um, the flexibility that Explain you mentioned. Explain to people definitely. what showrooming means. So I you're going to end up seeing retail spaces become more like a showroom. Um, people will have pre-selected items perhaps before they come in store. Salespeople may pre-populate a fitting room for them or, or a, ba- a package for them. Um, and then they come in and, and then whatever else they want to purchase, they look around them. Uh, you know, in the short term, I think there may be, um, fear of many people touching a particular 
item. So there may be single displays of each thing. And then when you're ready to purchase or try on, the sales associate gives you, um, gives you that particular item, um, which I think is going to put more pressure on sales staff. I think we're going to see a need for more sales staff better training for sales staff and better compensation. Um, you know, that, that's a totally different piece aside from, from the, um, the store design itself. But when you think about it, the, the store is a tool for the employee and they need to have the full toolkit in order to be successful. So how can they explain the brand? How can they explain the product to the, the best ability they can? And so whether there's digital augmentation for them um, through iPads or, or some other device, um, as well as in-store messaging, and perhaps even just scrolling content on LCDs that show people in, in the apparel or, or what, how to wardrobe, um, things like that. But I, I think it, you're going to see um, a need for increased educated sales staff because that's the single point of differentiation between online and in-store. Um, and I think the environments need to feel comfortable and natural. And so how do you create basically a home for the employee for them to do their best work? So walk me through, you mentioned coming from Manhattan, coming down to Charlotte, how you saw a big opportunity, a lot of runway for retail in Charlotte. Um, obviously, it's it's not Manhattan, it's not Chicago, it's not LA, it's not uh, Boston. Uh, it's it's definitely on that kind of second tier city. Lots of money, lots of growth, lots of great things. Love Charlotte, but not not saying not saying anything disparaging. But talk to me about what you see as runway, what you see as opportunities. What does Charlotte not have now? And that can be brand wise, that can be design wise, that can be just a product sector of, of, of offering. What do you see that, that, that you think is a big opportunity for Charlotte as it, as it relates to retail, uh, sticks and bricks, design, all the things that you love? Well, you know, I feel like one of the, one of the things that's really lacking is a sort of a core um, downtown retail environment. I, I remember the very first time I came here, um, our offices were in Hearst Tower and the taxi driver dropped me off on Tryon right in front of Hearst Tower. And so I walked through the plaza there that has um, Foundation for the Carolinas and the little gallery down at the end and um, the little sandwich shop and, and uh, Malamar on the corner. And, and it, it had had that feeling of, you know, there's awnings and there's st- st- store signs and storefronts and I can see in and um there, there's a, a, a place there. But then when you walk down Tryon as a whole, it's not a pedestrian friendly environment. And I think the, the, the towers themselves, while beautiful, paid more attention when they were built to the, what the skyline looked like than what the sidewalk experience was going to be. And I think the big opportunity for Charlotte is to create that center of, den- of gravity for a, a, a well-rounded environment in the uptown corridor. Um, you know, looking at how to reposition podiums of, of existing buildings to set the retailers up for success with greater visibility into their storefronts, more inviting um, entryways that have canopies over them, perhaps outside seating, more generous sidewalks, um, you know, it's, it's beautiful with the trees and all, um, but, but there needs to be that other layer of, of how do you embed activity and life into it. I mean, right now there's a lot of um, retail traffic in the Overstreet Mall, which if you don't work in Uptown, you may not even know what Overstreet Mall is. Um, there's a lot of essential businesses in there, like, uh, you know, Walgreens and, and the guy who fixes my boots and things like that. But, um, you know, and, and places to grab lunch, but, but it buttons up by four o'clock at the latest. And so how do you create that street life on Tryon um, and attract those retailers? And, and we've got some, some great nuggets um, in the uptown area where um, we've got the museums and the symphony and, and um, night theater and Belk theater and, um, 
you know, to be able to capitalize on the families that are coming here or the couples that are coming for the entertainment or, you know, Staples Center, um, et cetera, and, and even the football games, you know, give them a place to go and to shop and to, and to be. And, um, you know, my, my big dream is to, to somebody's got to build an all Carolina's sports store that it, it, I think that would be a huge success where you pull from all the local professional teams, the ACC, the SCC. Um, and, and, you know, if you can get that one big successful retailer in, I think we'd be able to get other retailers in. Um, and, and that's really the, the problem is critical mass and, and lack thereof. And I think tourists, when they look at a city, they look for a place that they can go and, and buy souvenirs and, and see a slice of what the local flavor is and, you know, fashion or whatever. And, and you sort of need to kind of go to different places in, in Charlotte. Noda has its personality and there's a couple of re- retail stores there and South End has theirs, um, you know, and, and I think there's a huge opportunity for, for Uptown to curate itself and, um, and recreate what the sidewalk experience is. So how do you, how would you go about it in Uptown specifically? Cause you can't really unbake the cake, you know, the, the sidewalks kind of are what they are. The buildings are for a large part, what they are, especially on that kind of main trade, Tryon college church, like the, the main drags, mm-hmm. how would you, and, and you and I have talked about this a lot offline about our desire to do kind of like a pop-up, garden what i don't i don't even know what mm-hmm. you would call it specifically but something where you wouldn't have to redesign the streetscape per se you, you could get some stakeholders and and create something interesting that wouldn't cost you know 200 million dollars or something some kind of pick a pick a huge number so how would you go about attacking something that has been one way for decades and and is is it's a hard thing to kind of unroll. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, there's a um, little development in Shoreditch um, called Box Park. And that, that is a really neat little environment. It's not big at all. Um, and if you look at 7th Street and Tryon, um, I feel like Charlotte Center City Partners tried to create something, something akin to it. Um, but you know, I have a favorite expression. It's called, and it, and it's you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. And I kind of feel like it, this was sort of a safe. Um, you know, we plunked down some containers, and I think there's one section where they're stacked. But if you look at Box Park, um, what's fun about it is is sort of the diamond dynamism that they've got going on. So on the street level. Um, and the sidewalks are tiny, uh, but the shipping containers are used as as stores, and so they're small hyper curated um, and very distinct offerings all along and, and they swap them out. So, so you get that sort of pop-up kind of idea where you sort of never know who's going to be there every three, six months or whatever. So that's at the street level. And then there's access at the two ends and um, it's all F and B on the upper level. And it's sort of a a beer garden zone and you, you have to show ID when you get up there. Um, depending on what the events are going up, but they have a space large enough they can put up put a band up there, and so you have this sort of layering of experiences where you've got the retail at the street level, and then you've got the F and B up top. And people love being up top because you can watch everything. You get a view and voyeurism and all that good stuff. And if you took over, it, you know they've kind of taken over that that parking lot as it is, if you really plan it out and take it over wholesale, you, you pretty much have the same um, area as box, box Park has, probably even more. And, and so, you know, really go to it and, and see, how, see how that works. Because I think right now is there's not going to be a better time to test and try. The consumer is willing to forgive. They are willing to experiment along with the retailer or the mall developer or whoever, because we all know that we're in this new place and um, we, we need to get creative and, and try different things. And I think building ownership needs to be open to embracing it and giving it a chance. 
Um, you know, if you look um, towards the south end of Tryon, there's the, the Wells Plaza over there, and it's just this large expanse. It, that would be great to have little pop, pop-up market kiosks um, that people can come and shop during the day. And it's, it's an attract element. It's, it's visual, and it's usually fun-looking, and, and that's the point. You, you, you want to attract them and, and keep them coming back. I, I was really excited to see that the, um, the farmer's market is, is now, and I think it's going into its fourth week um, now for, for uptown. And, and that's kind of fun because I, I live uptown and, and it's, it's great to have different venues that you can go to and, and experience these urban type experiences in the uptown area. So you mentioned the, the consumer and the ability to kind of reinvent yourself. What do you think are logical brands or categories that will emerge on the other side of this thing? Obviously we've had a, from everybody, everybody that says we've had a five-year acceleration in, in online consumer trends and behaviors. Who do you think will come out of this with, you know, either the balance sheet, the willingness, the business model, to continue to grow in a brick and mortar fashion as opposed to just say, nah, I'm just going to spend a a million dollars a day on Instagram and Facebook advertising and and just, just go in that direction completely. Who do you think can, can continue the, the carrying the brick and brick and mortar kind of mantle? Well, I think anybody involved in sports, um, you know, wellness is, is huge. I think there's becoming, um, there was a big focus on health and wellness Going into COVID, I think that that's just become all the more enormous. So anything having to do with, um, you know, yoga and fitness, all that kind of stuff, mind, body, um, food, the, the, the total health outlook, um, I think will continue to be successful. And coupling the product with experience is, is a huge win. So, you know, if you have yoga stores that also have a yoga studio, if you have, um, fitness that also sells the equipment, if you have, um, specialty food stores that also do cooking instruction, um, you know, I think some of the, the fun things we've seen come out of the restaurants that have closed, um, during this time and, and didn't necessarily want to get into takeout, um, they, the, the chefs have actually put, created stores out of there, um, which should have tables for people to be dining. And um, it's the, the, the food they pick up from the market. So it's chef selected, um, again, hyper curation food, foodstuffs for, you know, the home chef to come and the chef sharing their recipes and techniques for them to be able to make their restaurant favorites at home. And I think that's amazing because I don't think you'd, I don't think they're short circuiting themselves. I think people still want to go back to the restaurant and, you know, it's never going to be exactly the way your particular chef is going to be making it. Um, So, so I think those are like some really successful examples of what we've seen going on. Um, You know, I, I also think that there's, but there's been this whole resurgence of people embracing the outdoors. Everybody wants to get outside because they've been sheltered in place. Um, a friend of mine owns a uh, Wild Birds Unlimited store, and his business has been through the roof. People have rediscovered their backyards. Um, they're sitting outside. I mean, I'm on Zoom meetings all the time, and half the people on the Zoom meetings are sitting in their backyard or on their back deck or whatever. Um, and every people are enjoying watching the birds. Um, there, there's some, he was telling me, I think it's the Audubon society or something. There's a backyard bird count day, um, that, you know, people can report in how many birds they've seen in their backyard. And it was a 40% lift on the people reporting in, um, for this year. So, so I think any, anybody in that space that has to do with, you know, the outdoors health, I, I think they're all. It's, it's going to be about people improving their lives, the quality of their lives, the things they've discovered through the process here, um, and, and engaging with family. I think people, families have not spent this much time together um, probably for 
their whole duration of being a family. You know, we, we've all been sort of like together. And one, of, one of the guys on my team said, yep, we're, you know, me, Tina and the kids are all sitting around the table doing our respective work, you know? So it's, it's a lot. So um, to be able to do things together and then, and then go outside and do, do things together or separately, I think is, is going to be important. It'll be very interesting to see what kind of reversion to the mean is in all of this like I, i've been doing a ton of uh, mountain biking dirt biking and you know camping and you just all this all this interesting stuff that you could still do uh and my wife is like you realize that once you start working you know pick a number of hours a, a week again all that's just going to stop and I, but i wonder i wonder if that's the case uh because i think a lot of people have have been forced to downshift here i don't know if everybody's gonna you know, be looking to go back into back straight to sixth gear, uh, when, when this is yeah. done, I'll be, I'll be very interested to see, you know, what are the, what are the hangover effects of this? No, I, I totally agree. I, I think people, this has been, you know, I've heard it called the great re- reset and, and that's exactly what it feels like. I, you know, I, I feel the same. We, we went hiking up at, um, uh, chimney rock yesterday mm-hmm. and, and, uh, but your cal- calves are feeling it. It's a lot of steps. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it's a lot of steps. But but it was great. It was it was a full day out, and we did it in the middle of the week, so it wasn't as crowded. And um, you know, and I, and and I think that's another thing that's really interesting. The weekend effect for retail, I I suspect is going to be a bit out the window for at least the next couple of years. Um, you know, it, it always used to be people would work during the week. If they could get a little bit done in the evening, they would. But predominantly, you're doing the lion's share of what you got to do on the weekends. And now, because people are home and they're trying to look for lesser crowds, they're going on Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, Friday midday, late afternoon on Tuesday. So so what retailers are seeing is there's a more even distribution of sales throughout the week as opposed to just on the weekend. So so how do you, how do you em, embrace that? And it, again, it's going to go to your sales staff models, but then also the flexibility of your space. And um, you know, where people before maybe had been tailoring store sets for the weekend, now you're probably going to have to shift store sets multiple times during the week. So um, how to rotate that, that product up? Because I think people are also doing shorter, more frequent trips as opposed to one and staying longer. So Kathleen, you've already been extremely generous with your time. I want to take a moment and just say thank you for that. Uh, tell people how they can see your work, engage with you, get in contact with you, uh, pick your brain about all things uh, design and sticks and bricks. Oh, sure. So um, feel free to reach out to me at Kathleen underscore Jordan at Gensler.com. Um, you can look up my projects um, on Gensler.com. Just search by by my name um, and they'll come up and they'll also bring up some of the blogs that I've written. I'm a regular contributor to VMNSD.com in their blogs and perspectives section. So there's a couple of years worth of blogs sitting in there. So, And if you take nothing away from this podcast today, remember this, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. <laughs> I like that. And I'm, I'm definitely going to use that again. Kathleen, it's, it's always fun to, to chat retail with you, especially today, because um, we're, we're all kind of looking for a little bit of perspective right now. So I want to take a second and acknowledge you. Thank you for coming on. It's always such a pleasure to, to hear your voice and to, and to hear your perspective. Oh, my pleasure, Adam. It was fun. Thanks, Thanks for inviting me. All righty. Take care.